joining us for the Brock Prize Symposium. I'm Ed Harris. I'm the administrator for the Brock Prize. I want to thank each of you for being here. This is a uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, you have a lot of things to do, and I'm so honored that you chose to, do, to come here to be with us. Three universities partner with us in the prize, Oklahoma State University, University of Oklahoma, and the University of Tulsa. Uh, they all alternate hosting the symposium and the, and the uh, awards dinner. We're so honored that this year it's the University of Tulsa. We, have, we get to do the symposium in this uh, beautiful uh, place here. And so I would like to introduce you to Roger Blaze, who, you, who will give you an official TU welcome. Uh, Dr. Blaze serves as T, is University of Tulsa's provost and vice president for academic affairs. He's a founding member, member of our executive committee and is also a great supporter of the prize as well as education in general. So, Dr. Blaze, would you please come to the stand? Thank you, Roger. Thank you for your preface, too, about being short. My wife, since there's clergy here, my wife always reminds me right before I come up here, she goes, Ed, always remember no one's ever complained about a short sermon. And so, uh, so I end up cutting my notes and everything right before I come. So there's another person I'd like to introduce. And if it weren't for this person, uh, there would not be a Brock Prize. John Brock is a native Oklahoman. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma with a degree in geological engineering and is a, a successful oil and gas entrepreneur who still goes to work every day at 8, 8 a.m. and uh, unless he's skiing in Colorado. And he uh, only missed a couple of weekends since 1st of January of skiing. And the Brocks have demonstrated their dedication to make our society a better place. And that's one of the main reasons for the Brock Prize. And one key way to do this is through education. John reminds us often that the most important thing we do in life is educate our children. So I'd like to introduce you to the founder and benefactor of the Brock International Prize in Education, John Brock. John, would you please stand? As I mentioned, uh, three institutions partner uh, with the prize. They partner with, with us. And uh, we have a co an executive committee made up of representatives from each of those institu institutions. Uh, today, we, well, let me just introduce, let me tell you who they are. Uh, only one is here today, but one is Dr. Pam Fry, Associate Provost and, and Associate Vice President for Undergrad Studies at Oklahoma State University. She could not make it today. She's on our executive committee. Dr. R.C. Davis Undiano, Director of World Literature today at the University of Oklahoma. He also could not be with us today. Uh, our third member is Dr. Roger Blaze, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. You've already met him, but thank you so much, Roger, for being here and hosting us today. 
I'd also like to introduce a few other people that are in our audience. Um, first is Mr. Drew Diamond, director of Jewish, the Jewish Federation of Tulsa. Mr. Diamond, would you please stand? Also, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Joe Johnson. He's the Associate Dean for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, which is, uh, the acronym is Project ECHO. It's a very innovative way to get healthcare information out to rural, uh, rural places in, in Oklahoma. And he's at the OSU Center for Health Sciences. So Dr. Johnson. And while Dr. Johnson is the Associate Dean, I'd like to also introduce you to Ms. Tara Jackson, who's a director of Project ECHO at OSU Center for Health Sciences. So Tara, would you please stand? <laughs> the last person I'd like to introduce is uh, a person who I feel very fondly uh, toward, and that's Dr. Trent Gabert. He was uh, Associate Dean for the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Oklahoma. He was the first administrator for the Brock Prize, and he's laid the foundation for everything we do. So Trent, thank you. Some of you may not know about the Brock Prize in education. Uh, the Brock Prize is about big ideas that make a big difference. What we look for are those ideas, those educational ideas that ma make an impact in society and so we're not just looking, there's a lot, for those, there's a lot of people in education or have been through the educational system, everybody's been through the educational system, so you know that a lot of ideas come and go. And we're not really, those are nice sometimes, uh, but sometimes we're glad to see them go. We're not, we're not here to celebrate those, and we don't exist to celebrate those. We want ideas that make a difference and a discernible difference that we can showcase, and that's what, we're, and that's what we do. And so it's not just the, about the idea, but an idea that makes a big change in the way we think and the way we act. So an import, important part of the mission is to share those ideas with the world, and that's why we're here today. And so before we begin with our, our keynote address, I'd like to, we put together a three minute video that sort of tells a little bit about the prize. Uh, Roger mentioned some of our past laureates and you'll get to see uh, pictures of those. So. discovered a lot of good ideas, new ways to educate, new ways to, for, that people learn that we have yet to adopt into our schools. And that's the, what the Brock Prize hopes to accomplish is expose our educators to uh, those new ideas, new ways of teaching and learning. We want to help shape a culture of innovation and discovery in the global education community. We do this by identifying and awarding educational change makers and sharing their best ideas with the world. In doing so, we hope to promote ideas that would be useful to educators everywhere and that will bring about long-term systemic change in the world. If the whole country cared about teachers and education the way that John and Donnie do, we'd be really soaring, and teachers would be the rock stars of America.
glad the video worked. I was about to say, I, don't, I have no talents to for, take up time and space here. So, um, Last fall, a jury selected our 2018 laureate. We have nine jurors, and each juror made a case for his or her nominee. I'd like to introduce the juror who nominated our 2018 laureate. Yohai Gross is an educator specializing in at-risk and special needs youth. He graduated from the Academic College of Tel Aviv with a BA in Government and Society and earned a Master's in Israeli Studies from the University of Hapa. Currently, he's an emissary for the Jewish Agency, works here in Tulsa for the, with the Jewish Federation. Uh, he works to enrich the Tulsa community by educating them about the state of Israel. Yohai, would you please stand? And now for the introduction of our laureate. Lee Gordon is co-founder of Hand in Hand Center for Jewish Arab Education in Israel, an Israeli nonprofit organization that has created a network of integrated public school serving Arab and Jewish children. Starting with just 50 students in 1998, Hand in Hand now has six campuses and over 1,800 Jewish and Arab students. It is making a significant and growing impact in Israel for Jewish-Arab partnerships, coexistence, and especially peace. Lee is a native of Portland, Oregon, has lived for 20 years in Israel, where he received a master's in social work from the Hebrew University and graduated from the Mandel Institute School for Educational Leadership. His, uh, his years of involvement in the peace movement in Israel, as well as Jewish-Arab and Israeli-Palestinian dialogue, both inspired and prepared him to establish Hand in Hand, and in 1999 to create American Friends of Hand in Hand, a nonprofit American organization supporting the organization's work in Israel, of which Lee serves as, as executive director. Lee now lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife and children, and I, we, I got to know him not only through email and on the phone, but last night we had a, a great dinner. I got to know him even better today and it's with great pleasure that I introduce the 2018 Brock Prize Laureate, Lee Gordon. I'm gonna stand a little close to you so I can see you better, and um, I apologize for my crooked smile. It's a smile, but it, it's sort of one-sided. Um, I first of all wanna thank you, uh, John, John Brock, for your leadership, for your generosity, for believing in the power of education for innovation, not for the sake of innovation, but innovation to help change people's lives and make a better future. Um, I, I feel very honored. Um, and I, I want you to know, as you know, that the award is gonna go to our organization hand in hand. Um, I wanna thank you, Ed, for, for uh, it was wonderful getting to know you uh, this short time, and I hope that we'll continue this friendship. I wanna thank Yochai, my new friend, um, and when you go back to Israel soon, you'll be an honorary member of Hand in Hand. I want to thank uh, Cindy Schaefer over there and everybody else who's made this possible and made my visit, um, made me feel welcome. Uh, it's only my second time in Oklahoma and this is a great way to, to get to know your community. Um, I really I want to tell some stories and I think those stories will help convey what Hand in Hand and what our vision and mission is all about. So um, a little bit less theoretical and more personal stories of, of what goes on in, in Israel in our schools. Um, on September 1st, 1998, it was the first year of the school, first day of the school year in Israel. I spent that day in northern Israel in an area called Mizgav in the Galilee region of northern Israel. It was the first day of one of our two schools, and our first day of that school, which consisted just of one first grade class, 32 pupils. And I stayed out of the classroom because I wasn't one of the teachers. And at the end of the school day, about two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, a bunch of Jewish and Arab kids came out of their classroom waving this piece of paper, uh, showing off how they'd learned how to write their name in Hebrew and in Arabic. Now, here in Tulsa, you might ask, what is the big deal? I think many people in this room could write or say, mi nombre es Lee Gordon, my name is Lee Gordon in Spanish. But in Israel, doing this was really a, quite a radical and even revolutionary step. And hopefully I'll convey to you why this was such a big step. Um, if children grow up in a war zone, um, how do you prevent them from hating everybody 
on the other side of that conflict. We believe that one way is to bring them together in the same classroom, in the same school, day after day, year after year. In Israel today, 22% of its citizens are Palestinian Arabs. They're part of the larger Palestinian community that lives in the West Bank, lives around the world. But inside of Israel, even though it's defined as a Jewish country, 22% of the people are, are Arab, 78% are Jewish. And yet these two communities live almost totally segregated and separated lives. Very little contact between them. And that, con that separation and segregation is most prevalent in the school system. So in the public schools in Israel, you have Arab-only Arabic language schools, and you have Jewish-only Hebrew-speaking schools. There's no law that prevents an Arab and a Jew from going to school together, but there are language differences, Hebrew and Arabic. There are geographical differences. Many Arabs and Jews live in separate communities. And there's this history, this 130-year-long history of conflict between these two communities. I believe that the Arab-Jewish-Palestinian-Israeli conflict is the longest enduring modern conflict, longer than anything else. It's not the most vicious conflict. Uh, it doesn't have the highest rate of violence or loss of life. On the northeastern border of Israel, there's a w civil war going on in Syria, which has claimed 500,000 lives. You don't have that level of violence. And yet, this is a conflict that eight US presidents um, have tried to solve and haven't been able to. And our current president is, is putting forth some peace overtures. Um, it's eluded. Uh, wise leaders, it's eluded less wise leaders, it's eluded all kinds of diplomatic initiatives and peace processes, and peace is still a distant kind of dream. Um, I would venture to say that one of the most common emotions felt in Israel among Arabs and Jews is cynicism. There are polls that say that the majority of Israelis when asked, do you believe in some kind of territorial compromise in order for there to be peace between the, the, the Palestinians and the Israelis? Most people say yes, but then if you ask them, do you believe that's possible, and they say no. So in 1998, I had a chance to have been uh, in a two-year fellowship program called the School for Educational Leadership. I'm a social worker by training, and this program exposed me to schools. And I realized that a school is a wonderful place to build bridges between people because, one, you have a captive audience. You have children who are there by law, and they're there day after day, week after week, month after month. Two, you're able to not only work with kids, you can work with, with teachers, with parents, and the wider community. And looking at the school system that was completely separated, we thought, if we could build a model that brings Jewish and Arab children together in the same classroom, teaching them English, uh, Hebrew and Arabic simultaneously, maybe we can make a dent on this separation and create a, a little model that would be replicated elsewhere. Um, I want to tell a story about uh, bringing people together and overcoming hatred. In the very early days of our school, there was a Jewish father named Adam who had his son in the school, and I believe he started in kindergarten. In the second year, he spent a lot of time riding around on his bicycle, handing out flyers, because in those days, we, were, we had just two classes. We were really recruiting parents one by one. He put flyers in people's mailboxes. He lived in a poor neighborhood in Jerusalem, a Jewish neighborhood, and he used to go to a mom-and-pop grocery store, which is still quite common, the kind of place where you get credit and pay at the end of the week. And the owner of the store knew that he was sending his son to an integrated Jewish Arab school. And he went in there one day with his son. And the owner, you know, politely, but kind of firstly said, you know, why are you sending your kid to study with the Arabs? Um, you know, behind your back, they all want to kill you. And his six-year-old son said, my teacher's an Arab. She doesn't want to kill me. So that doesn't prove that by bringing Arab and Jewish children together, you can end this conflict. Or by bringing, in Rwanda, Tutsi and Hutu children together. Or by Catholic and Protestant children in, in Northern Ireland. Or Pakistani and Indian children together. But it does prove that people can change, and children can um, grow up with a different attitude and learn how to trust and respect and admire differences instead of fearing that kind of difference. I lived in Israel for 20 years, as Ed said. Um, I graduated from Hebrew University with a master's degree in social work. And during that time, there was a, a lot of effort to build uh, encounters between Jewish and Arab students. I led a group at Hebrew University for two years. We had Jewish students and Arab students that came together once a week, and we would talk about all kinds of things and often eat 
Middle Eastern food together. And one of the things that was a, a common denominator of all these groups is that they were very superficial. People would have a very interesting time, and they'd usually go home at the end of these, these sessions and never see each other again. Um, and it was my exposure to schools and that experience in those encounter groups that I realized we needed to do something that was much deeper, that could create more systemic change, that could be lasting. We had to create institutions in which people in Israel would see that Jews and Arabs can study together, work together, uh, create uh, economic enterprises together. So in 1997, I built a small board. I raised a little money. I'd never started an organization before. I'd never raised more than $10 in my life. And I started traveling around the country, meeting with educators, uh, mayors of small towns, heads of education district. There's a, a superintendent of, of Union Public Schools here. Um, and I would say that the most common reaction I got when I presented this idea of building an integrated school was, crazy idea, it'll never work. There's one case in particular I want to mention. I went with, to northern Israel, an area called Achziv, which is close to the Lebanese border on the Mediterranean Sea. And I met with a man who was the principal of a secondary school, a Jewish secondary school. And the first thing he said to me is, I'm a very liberal guy. I go to all the peace demonstrations. I really believe that we have to make peace with our, our Arab neighbors. But what you're trying to do is completely unnatural. Jews and Arabs are like oil and water. They will never get together. There's too much water that has flowed under the bridge to reverse the, the inertia. And my response to him was, I believe that anything that human beings choose to do out of free choice and not out of coercion is natural. There are a lot of things that have been invented that weren't natural to begin with, but we've invented them and they've become commonplace. Um, and then there were a few people, the minority, who said it is really a crazy idea and it probably will never work, but you should go for it. And that was enough for us to, for a few of my colleagues who I put together with me, to feel like, well, maybe we can give this a try. We decided we wanted to open a school in Jerusalem where I was living, but we needed a backup because if the school in Jerusalem fell flat on its face, we needed a second option to make sure we were going to be successful. So in Jerusalem, we started with a kindergarten class, um, 25 students inside of an existing school. And I mentioned in the Galilee, we started with a first grade class. But before we got to that point, a second story I want to tell is in February of 1998, we uh, organized our first meeting of parents in which I wanted to recruit Jewish and Arab parents who could be prospective parents of children who would sign up for the kindergarten. And we chose to have the meeting in an Arab village because I wanted to see if Jewish parents would be willing to go out of the comfort of their homes into a village where the minority lived. Many Jews were afraid to go into an Arab village. Um, I had hired two actresses, one Palestinian actress from Bethlehem, which is just south of Jerusalem, and one Jewish actress in Jerusalem, and they were kind of a team who were demonstrating how you could act and do a bilingual theater, the Palestinian woman speaking only Arabic, the Jewish woman only Hebrew, and somehow make themselves understood. We had agreed to pay them 1,600 shekels, which was a lot of money for us in the early days. Um, the meeting was called for uh, 8.30 p.m., it happened to be a thunderstorm and a very stormy night, a windstorm. The meeting was in a, a conference room in the mayor's office in this small town called Kaukab Abu al Haja, which is named after a Muslim general who fought against the Crusaders and won in 1200 and something. At 8.35, there were seven people in the room. And I'm an eternal optimist, and I was saying, well, it's raining, it's stormy, it's late. We'll come back in three weeks, and we'll do it again, and we'll, we'll start over. Um, and without exaggeration, at 8.55, there were 150 people crowded in the room. Um, the standing room was a much smaller room than this. Uh, we think it was about 40% Jewish uh, participants, 60% uh, Arab participants. The meeting went on for a long time. We did our bilingual theater. I presented the idea of the schools. There were three of the three mayors of the four towns that were presented. And a little bit before 11, the Jewish mayor of this regional council called Misgav got up and he said, and I'm translating from the Hebrew, you know, we've been sitting here, a group of Jews and Arabs, for two hours having a very heated but civil and meaningful conversation. And that in and of itself is a rare thing in Israel. Jews and Arabs just don't come together. Let's take the energy in this room and make this idea of a new bilingual integrated school a reality. Now, we didn't have a single parent who was registered. We hadn't hired any teachers. We had a space for the school. 
we had a lot of hurdles to, but I had this kind of aha moment where I felt we'd passed over a hump, and I knew then, in my gut, that the school was going to open. So I mentioned we opened the school in September of 1998 with 55 children, not very auspicious uh, beginnings. Um, those first graders went into second grade, and there was a new first grade class. Those kindergartners went into first grade, and there was a new kindergarten class. Today, as Ed mentioned, we have just under 1,800 students in six schools around the country, and I'm not exaggerating, I got these, checked these numbers. In September, we had 803 students on our waiting list. So almost half as many students as there are in the school are on the waiting list. We could not accommodate all of them. And over the, um, over the past two years, my colleagues in Israel have received requests from 14 different community groups, some of them larger, some of them smaller, asking us, can we come into their community and start schools? Clearly, we can't open 14 schools. I mean, those of you who are educators know that opening a school is not like turning on the light. It takes a tremendous amount of effort, not just funding, but organizational effort, training, curriculum. But we have plans, active plans, to open three new schools. And I want to tell you about two places. One, many of you know, have heard of the city of Nazareth, um, biblical city. Jesus spent time there. Nazareth, the city, is an Arab city made up of Muslims and Christians. There's a, the largest church in the Middle East sits there. Um, in the 1950s, the Israeli government was very worried. They thought that their Arab minority was a threat to the population, and they felt that in the Galilee, which at that time had an Arab majority population, they thought, we have to bring Jews into the Galilee. So they took agricultural land all around Nazareth and built a new city called Upper Nazareth, or Nazareth Elite, which has started small and now has about 60,000 people. The city of Nazareth, the Arab city, the ancient city of Nazareth, has nowhere to expand, so young Arab couples in that city have been moving every year more and more into the, into the city, which was originally created as a Jewish city, and now it's a mixed city with about 30,000 Arab inhabitants, 30% uh, Arab inhabitants, 70% Jewish inhabitants. The Arab kids can either go to a Jewish Hebrew-speaking school, but that means they have to sacrifice and give up their language, and they have to be a tiny minority in a much larger Jewish majority, or they can come down the hill and take long bus rides into Lower Nazareth. So we're working there with the mayor and a group of parents to open a school there, and we believe that if not in 2019, then in 2020 we will have a new school. We're probably going to start with a preschool. And then there is a city called Akko. In English, it's pronounced acre, like the acres of land. It's north of Haifa. Uh, if you flew from Haifa to Akko, it would be 12 miles. It's very close. It's also a famous city. Napoleon put Akko under siege in 1795 and didn't succeed. It's a beautiful, gorgeous city on the Mediterranean. And traditionally, it is an Arab city, Muslim and Christian. Now there are many Jews there. And they, too, go to separate, segregated schools, even in neighborhoods, literally, where in the same apartment building, there are Arabs and Jews living there. But uh, Ibrahim, the Arab child, has to go down and turn to the right and go to his Arab-speaking school in Avraham, same name, different languages, Abraham in both languages. He comes downstairs and has to go to his school. Um, there we have probably 100 parents who are very interested. The mayor is interested. And so we're hoping to open a school there as well. Um, I would like to show a short video, if I could, um, because I really, and I also want to say that I'm the founder of Hand in Hand, but I really believe very strongly that starting things is often much, much easier than continuing them and building them. Because sometimes I didn't do this, but sometimes you can start something and walk away and leave it to someone else to run. I didn't really walk away. I came back and, and continued to raise support for Hand in Hand. But my colleagues in Israel, especially the teachers, are doing really, really, really hard work. In all of our classes, we have two teachers, one Arab and one Jewish, uh, up to about sixth grade. And then they, once they're functionally bilingual, they can deal with. And you would think two teachers in a classroom of 26, 27 kids, it makes it much easier because the ratio, instead of being 26 to 1, is maybe 13 to 1. But actually, we believe it's much harder because not only do they have to decide how they're going to share their authority because they're not a lead teacher and assistant teacher, they're co-teachers. They have to stick to their own language. The Arab teacher primarily speaks only in Arabic and the Jewish teacher only in Hebrew. And in the context of this conflict, they have a lot of disagreement, um, especially when talking about modern Israeli history, when the Palestinians view things very differently than the Jews do. And they have to show, well, we can agree to disagree. They can decide where they want to show the kids they agree, where they disagree. 
Um, they also have to create chemistry. I mean, that's on a, on a purely sort of psychological level. They have to get along, and sometimes there's not the, the best match. Um, another thing is I would say that probably a third of our curriculum we've created from scratch. Um, when we're teaching science, when we're teaching math, when we're teaching the arts, or when we're teaching maybe Roman or ancient European history, there are pieces of ready-made curriculum that we can get through the Ministry of Education or the local Jerusalem or whatever school district we're working in. But we have to teach kids who come from three different religions. We have uh, Muslim Arabs and Christian Arabs and Jews. We have kids whose grandparents and great-grandparents literally and figuratively could have been shooting at each other. Because in, before 1948, there were serious... And we have to deal with a lot of current events that spill into our school every day. And I'll tell you about maybe five current events, and they all happen to do with war. We've had three small, short wars, but wars nonetheless between Israel and the Hamas organization in Gaza, with Hamas sending rockets into Israel and Israel retaliating with, with heavier and stronger firepower. We've had two wars between Israel and the Hezbollah organization in Lebanon, also with rockets coming into Israel. And then the last war, there was, there were, Israeli soldiers went into Lebanon, 135 soldiers were killed. Um, these things happen, you know, Everything is in close proximity. One of the rockets that came from Hezbollah, it was in the summer, it fell a quarter of a mile away from where our school looked, and it, it landed in, a, in an agricultural field. Uh, kids see that, parents see that, and clearly we talk about that in our school. We don't hide those things. We don't shove anything under the rug. We do it wisely in age-appropriate ways, and one of the things that we uh, have said from the very beginning is we do not need to put the entire burden of this conflict on the shoulders of five and six-year-old kids. We don't want our kids to be guinea pigs. We want them to play soccer and like their teacher or dislike their teacher and do their homework or not do their homework and do math. And if you go into our school, a lot of visitors go in and say, well, are you doing conflict resolution exercises? And the kids sometimes roll their eyes and said, you know, this girl is just my friend. She's not my Arab friend or my Jewish friend. She's my friend and she happens to be Arab. These kids are just regular kids but doing something pretty heroic in a lot of ways. But we do want to put on the shoulders of the parents a lot of this burden, and so we engage the parents in facilitated dialogue, and we also discovered that the parents are the ones that have more difficulty with this, because they grew up in segregated schools. The kids came at age five and age six, and for them this is normal. Um, I'll stop for a second, show this video, uh, which is about nine minutes long, it has subtitles, and there's some very poignant scenes with uh, high schoolers, 12th graders, last year's graduating class, talking about, uh, it's at the end of the film, the Jewish students are being drafted into the army. Jews in Israel have mandatory military service, men for three years, women for two years. Arabs are not drafted, and that's a real difficult sort of, sort of uh, 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 juxtaposition between them, because the army, they're being drafted into an army that is, in many cases, on guard, defending against Palestinians, and the kids in our schools are also Palestinian, so hopefully you can gather that, and then I can talk a little bit more. כאמור, יותר משנה אחרי ההצתה, בית הספר הדו-לשוני צריך להתמודד עם כמה אתגרים. הישן שכבר מכירים, איך למשל מעבירים שיעור בשתי שפות. והאתגר החדש, איך שומרים, למרות הכל, על דו-קיום בין תלמידים יהודים לערבים, בעיצומו של גל טרור שבו המחבלים הם בגיל של תלמידי בית הספר. הפתרון שמצאו שם, לא להסתפק רק בלימודים, אלא לדבר על הבעיות כמה שיותר. ציון אנוס יצא למסע לימודי שם. נוי, לאן סירין הלכה עם עשרה שקלים? לאן היא הלכה? לסופר, נכון. דפקתי לו עשרה, עכשיו אני יודעת שאתם למלבס, ללוחה עוד תלת תלת שווקל. שום סיפור לי אנחנו. אתם רוצים לדעת כמה נשאר. יפה, בזל. הדבר הראשון שבולט בבית הספר הדו-לשוני היא הטבעיות. האופן הכמעט אגבי שבו שיעור חשבון לכיתה א' במקרה הזה מתנהל במקביל בשתי השפות. מה רוצים לדעת בסיפור? אש, סולימן, שוסר, 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 בעיר הכי מסוכסכת, הכי מדממת, בשיא הפחד וחוסר האמון בני עמים, יהודים וערבים יושבים יחד, מתערבבים, ולאף אחד זה לא נראה יוצא דופן. 
במציאות הקיימת היום, רוב הבעיות שקיימות בגלל ההפרדה. בחוץ ערבים לא פוגשים יהודים, יהודים לא פוגשים ערבים. ומה שקורה, כל אחד מפנטז לעצמו איך הערבי נראה, מה הוא חושב, מה הוא מדמיין, והפוך אותו דבר. לבחור בבית הספר הזה, לבחור בדרך החינוך הזו, לבחור בקהילה הזו, זה לא להגיד, זאת המציאות, ככה היא נשאר איתה. זה להגיד, אנחנו לוקחים חלק מעשי, אקטיבי, בלשנות את המציאות. צריכים להכיר את האחר, וכדי להכיר את האחר צריך ללמוד את השפה שלו ולתקשר איתו. אז אחרת זה בלתי אפשרי. ערב תושבת כותם אלו. וכך זה טבעי לחלוטין שבגן לומדים במקביל את האלף בית של שתי השפות. העברית והערבית מתנהלות כאן בהרמוניה מוחלטת. וכששני ילדים קוראים את ספר השיאים של גינס, אי אפשר לדעת מי מהם הוא עתאי פלד ומי יזן מסאורה. אי אפשר להבדיל בשבילי בית הספר מי יהודי ומי ערבי. אנחנו השפיות. לגמרי. ושאומרים לנו, אנחנו בועה, בחוץ בעיניי מה שקורה זה לא מציאותי, מה שקורה כאן זה המציאותי. בית הספר הדו-לשוני יד ביד קיים כבר 17 שנה. יש בו כ-650 תלמידים מטרום חובה עד י"ב, מספר מאוזן של יהודים וערבים. כעשרה אחוז תושבי ירושלים המזרחית. <מח> למשל אמירה, שמדי בוקר מביאה את שלושת הילדים שלה מעיסאוויה. הייתה לי תקופה שחשבתי שאני מכניסה את הילדים שלי למין כזה סכיזופרניה. איך זה נגיד שאנחנו, בעיסאוויה יש חיילים שהם יורים, וזה מסוכן, וזה לא נעים, וברגע שמגיעים לבית הספר, נגיד בתחילת השנה, היו חיילים שבאו לשמור עליהם. אז כאילו גם זה הכניס אותם לכל מיני שאלות. כשהילדים היו קטנים יותר, אז למשל היה את הסיפור של גלעד שליט. עכשיו, מי חטף את גלעד שליט? אם אני אומרת ערבים, אז זה לא מסתדר, כי זה לא... זה, 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 זה מתיישב לתוך ריבוע שאצלו ערבים זה החברים שלו. כן, אף אחד לא מסתיר שמדובר באתגר לא פשוט להורים, וגם לצוות ההוראה. אתה חושב שקל לי לבוא לבית ספר ומישהו בחוץ, שני מטרים מבית הספר קורא לי מחבלת? זה מאוד קשה. זה מאוד קשה לקבל את זה. סבאח אל-חיר לאל-ג'מיע. סבאח אל-חיר לאל-יום אינו פי עינה מחכמת אל-בוראק או בהוראות משפט תרפת. שיעור היסטוריה בכיתה ט', היום לומדים על מאורעות תרפ"ט. כמו תמיד, בבית הספר הדו-לשוני מעבירים אותו שני מורים בשתי השפות. המטרה שלנו של בית המשפט הזה, הדפנה מנהי אל-מחכמי, היא ערד אל-אחדת אלי חסלת סנט 1929. זה שאני מגיעה לכיתה, ואני רואה תלמיד יהודי מוכן לקבל אותי כמו שאני, ותלמיד ערבי מוכן לקבל את השותף שלי כמו שהוא, אז כן יש תקווה. הנרטיב הישראלי שמייצגים אותו לינה, קייס, מרק וג'רמאיה. השיעור הוא מעין משפט ציבורי על המאורעות. כל צד נדרש להציג את הנרטיב של הצד השני. תלמידים יהודים תחת דגל פלסטין, תלמידים ערבים תחת דגל ישראל. קשה לייצג לפעמים את הנרטיב של האחר, להיכנס עם הנשמה. אתה עכשיו יהודי בן יהודי, נולדת כך, אתה בן, אתה ציוני, כנס לראש הזה. היינו אצלכם, ואחרי זה הרומאים הוציאו אותנו מפה. לגלות, כן. מי שבונה את זה ראשון זה שלו. אתם באתם, גנבתם, שמתם את המסגרת שלכם עליו, הם מוצאים אותנו אחרי זה, לא רוצים להחזיר כל מילה בצלם. אני בטוח שיש השפעה על הדבר הזה. לדעת שהצד השני רואה את הדברים אחרת. לפעמים יש דיסאינפורמציה, אנשים לא יודעים שיש דברים אחרים, שהמציאות נראית אחרת בעיניים אחרות. חשוב להדגיש, תוכנית הלימודים הזאת, שבה אין אמת אחת חד משמעית, מאושרת על ידי משרד החינוך. מתוך הבנה די בסיסית, להכיר את הנרטיב של האחר לא אומר שצריך בהכרח להסכים איתו. זה לא אומר שתלמיד צריך לבוא ושיהיה לו דעה אחת, אלה צודקים או אלה צודקים. קודם כל הוא יודע שיש ריבוי, וזה חשוב. כאן לא הולכים יד ביד והכל ורוד ופרחים מסביב וזה, זה מורכב, זה קשה, אנחנו מזיעים. יום יום, כי כל דבר שקורה בחוץ יכול להשפיע על בית ספר. 
שוב בני דודים ממזרח ירושלים, בהם ילד שעדיין לא מלאו לו 12. ילדה בת 13, שבעקבות ריב עם אחיותיה, הייתה לדקור מאבטח. שתי נערות מחבלות, בנות 14 ו-16, תוקפות במספריים עוברים ושבים ברחוב יפו. אני לרגע לא מתכחשת לפחד, גם אני מפחדת. גם אני מפחדת להסתובב בעיר הזו. הנה, הילדים שלי לא נוסעים בתחבורה ציבורית. הילד הגדול שהוא בכיתה ד' עכשיו. אומר לי שהיום המורה שאלה אותנו, תנו אסוציאציה לרחוב של סתיו. אז הוא אמר שהוא ישר קפץ ואמר לה גז מדמיע. הדוקרים בגל הטרור היו לעיתים נערים מאותם שכונות של תלמידים בבית הספר. יותר מזה, התלמידים מירושלים המזרחית באים מחברה שבה לא קוראים לדוקרים מחבלים. שלא מאמינים לסרטונים האלה, ומבחינתם ניטרו למחבל. היא הוצאה להורג. אם תסתכלו קצת על החדשות, הצד הישראלי, דיווח המחבל חוסל. מבחינת הפלסטינים לא נחשב כמחבל, אלא כשהיד או כל סוג אחר. הילדים האלה גדלים לתוך מציאות שבה אנחנו לא מסתירים מהם את המורכבות. לא הם מדברים על זה, הם מדברים על הרגשות, על מה שקורה. יבוא ילד יגיד, זה שהיד, יבוא ילד אחר יגיד, זה מחבל. אין שיפוטיות. זה עדיין לא קשה ש... להם. כן, בכיתה כן. י"א, כשזה עלה... דרך השיחות ביניהם, שאחד קרא שהיד ואחד לא, ושהדיבורים על חיילי צה"ל היו כאלה ואחרים, זה היה להם קשה, והם דיברו, הם אמרו, תשמעו, זה קשה לי. זה קשה לי. תלמידה יהודייה באה לחברות הערביות, שאמרה, זה קשה לי שאתה מתבטאות ככה, תבינו. אם אנחנו נסכים לכל דבר, וואלה, אנחנו חיים בעולם ורוד. העולם לא ורוד. זאת המציאות. וזה מה שהם חווים יום-יום. הם לא מסכימים, הורים שלהם גם לא מסכימים, ויש פה חילוקי דעות. אבל מה המצע המשותף לכיתה, אם אין הסכמה? המשותף בכיתה זה שהם בחרו להיות ביחד. כן, התלמידים עצמם לא ממש הבינו את העיסוק האובססיבי שלנו בנושאים האלה. בכל זאת, מדובר בנערים ונערות שנמצאים יחד מגיל הגן כבר יותר מעשר שנים. למה שאני אריב איתו על מה זה מחבל או לא, אם אני יכולה לריב איתו על מה נאכל בצהריים? כאילו, אתה לא רב עם החבר שלך כל הזמן על פוליטיקה, אתה לא... תפריד את זה. או לא, גם... זה חיים מאוד עלובים. אני לא רואה את רזה, אני חושבת, היא ערבייה. זה לא מה שעובר לי בראש, שאני רואה אותה. אני רואה אותה, היא בתור גילו רזה, אני כאילו, היא חברה שלי, בכיתה. הם לא ישנו את זה עכשיו בשועפאט, הם לא... הם יוציאו את כל המחסומים וזה. אבל כשאני באה לבית ספר, אני יודעת שאני שווה לעמנואל. עובדה שאנחנו כן יכולים לדבר, אנחנו כן יכולים לעשות את השיח הזה על אותו עניין, להציג את הדעות השונות, להציג את המחשבות שלנו. לדעתי אנחנו הכי שפויים. יש בית ספר אחר בירושלים שאתה רואה פה ערבים ויהודים וכל הסוגים לומדים פה ושהם באמת מצליחים לשמור על שגרה? בית הספר היחיד בירושלים שבו לומדים תלמידים יהודים וערבים הפך שוב יעד לקיצוניים. אלמונים הציתו אמש שתי כיתות לימוד של ילדי כיתה א'. הנזק שנגרם כבד במיוחד, ואולם הנזק העיקרי הוא כמובן ניסיון הפגיעה במרקם הכל כך עדין שמייצר בית הספר הזה. חמש דקות ראשונות אמרתי מי ישלח ילדים לבית ספר ששורפים אותו. מה? משוגעים? מה קרה? יש גבול. אמרתי, זהו, נגמר בית ספר, לא ישלחו ילדים. יום אחר כך, 98% מהתלמידים מגיעים. זאת אומרת, mm-hmm. כל התלמידים מגיעים יום אחר כך לבית ספר. פתאום אתה רואה הורים, וילדים, ובוגרים, ותומכים. ואנשים שבאים ואומרים סליחה, אנחנו כאן. לא נסכים למעשים האלה, ואנחנו יחד נעזור כדי לחזור לשגרה. עזרנו לנקות את הכיתות, ועזרנו לסדר ותלינו שלטים, וזה היה דווקא משהו שמאוד מאוד איחד אותנו. ממש. ניתן לשני אנשים... טוב, אי אפשר להיכנס בטלוויזיה להפחיד אותנו? לא. זה המטרה שלהם, להפחיד אותנו, ואנחנו לא ניתן להם. התגובות להצתה גרמו למנהלי בית הספר להבין שהם מקור של כוח במציאות המטורפת מסביב. לקראת שנת הלימודים הנוכחית, כ-150 ילדים נותרו בחוץ ברשימות המתנה. רוצים לחיות כאן מהגן עד כיתה י"ב. היהודים תכף מתגייסים לצבא, ויכול להיות שהם יצטרכו לטפל בהפרות סדר בשכונה של החבר שלהם לכיתה. היה כבר מצב כזה, היה מצב שילד יהודי שסיים בית ספר... הוא, היה, הוא עמד במחסום, ואז ילד ערבי מהכיתה שלו עבר במחסום, והוא, ברגע שהוא ראה אותו, אולי, יכול להיות שבאותו רגע הוא שנא אותו, יכול להיות שבאותו רגע הוא קילל את כל החיילים ואת כל היהודים, כאילו, יכול להיות שזה קרה. אבל אחרי שהוא עבר את המחסום הזה, 
הוא כבר חוזר לחוויה שלו בבית ספר, והוא יודע כבר לסנן ולהפריד בין הדבר הזה ולדבר הזה. עכשיו, אם מאיה תהיה חיילת, יהיה לי קל עם זה? לא יהיה לי קל עם זה. אבל זה החיים של מאיה, ומאיה תעשה את זה, אם את איתה מה שהיא רוצה. אני אגיד לך, בשבילנו זה לא אכפת לנו אם בצבא אתה טבח, או אתה בחיל האוויר, או אתה תומך במערכת שקוראים לה צבא. שבשבילנו היא האויב. אתה מצפה מהחברים היהודים שלך לא ללכת לצבא? יש, אני, יש לי ציפייה כזאת, אני לא יכול כאילו לכפות עליהם את זה, ואני יודע שזה גם משהו שקשה, ואני אבין אם בסוף הם כן ילכו. הוא יצטרך להתמודד, הוא חבר שלי, הוא יתמודד עם זה. לא, אני לא אציע לעצבים שהיא הולכת ותומכת במערכת הזאת. נגיד, אני לא אלך לבוא לבית שלו עם מדים, זאת בחירה שאני אצטרך לעשות, ואני מאמינה שאני לא אעשה את זה. ואותו דבר, כאילו, לגבי הרבה דברים אחרים. הלוואי וכל החיים שלנו כאן היו נראים כמו בית הספר הדו-לשוני. עם הסובלנות וההקשבה, עם הרצון לשים את עצמך בנעליו של האחר, עם היכולת לא להתעלם מהמציאות המדממת, אלא לנסות ולהתמודד איתה באומץ, כי זאת בעצם הדרך היחידה. אולי אתם נאיבים, והקרע וחוסר האמון בין שני העמים האלה הוא כל כך גדול, שאין סיכוי לתקן אותו. אני, אנחנו לא באים לתקן. מי שמטעה אותך אומר לך שהדו לשוני יפתור את הסכסוך, זה סכסוך מאוד קשה, מאוד מורכב. אז בשביל מה? אני בשביל עושה זה את החלק שלי, הקטן הזה, בתוך המסגרת, ואם יהיו כמה שיעשו את החלק הזה, הקטן, אני חושבת שנחיה בעתיד יותר טוב. And I'm not sure you want to save questions for later, is that correct? I mean, I want, I want to just mention that, you know, it, it, you maybe saw some of these challenges. And, uh, and, but I really think the bigger challenges, and those of you who are educators will hopefully will understand this, the bigger challenges are not the political situation. They're little things, like I mentioned. How do you create a new curriculum? How do you bring people who really, really diverse backgrounds and diverse learning styles together? How do you deal with parents who come from very, very different cultures, Arab parents who want this kind of integration but come from maybe very traditional homes and are worried about their kids losing their identity, parents who are worried about their high school students dating when they might want that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, you did see that in 2014, in November, we had an arson attack at our school, but in many ways it brought everybody together. It even brought out people who would not be normal supporters of our school, but they said this kind of attack is, you know, is completely out of... out of place, you know, you don't, you don't attack children, you don't, if you want to criticize the school, fine, but setting fire to a school. We know who did it also, there are three young Jewish men, uh, religious extremists who are in jail now, serving jail terms um, from a small organization. Um, the sky is not the limit. We are not going to have, there are 1.8 million school children in Israel, approximately, in a country about the size of, eight, about 8 million total population. We have 1,800 children, so that's one, 100th or 1,000th. So pessimists will say we're a drop in the bucket or we're spitting into the wind. Um, I usually take the more optimistic view and say, one, we started with 50 and now we have 1,800. Two, everybody said it would never work and now it's working and we have a waiting list. Three, more and more people in Israel know about our schools because our goal is not necessarily for every child to be in our school. That, of course, is a wonderful experience, but we want other people to understand that this kind of coexistence and partnership is possible. So if people in Jerusalem know about the Max Rain hand-in-hand -hand bilingual school and see that kids are going to school and studying successfully and graduating with honors and going to university, they can also think, well, if Jews and Arabs can study together, maybe they can work together. Maybe we can make peace together. It stimulates people's imagination. And I, I like to use this analogy that I've used many times of my father who lived till he was 101. He died a number of years ago. He came from Lithuania, from a very poor Jewish community, was an orphan, came to stay with relatives. And when he came to America, he was introduced to bananas. And when I was growing up, there were always bananas, and my father ate bananas every single day of his life. And that was like bread and butter for him. Now, if no one had introduced him to bananas, he wouldn't have known they existed. So the same way we told people about the idea of bringing Jews and Arabs together, and they said, how is that possible? Oil and water, they don't mix. Now we've introduced them and we've stimulated their imagination. And sometimes to build peace and overcome conflict, you have to get people to think 
outside the box, educationally in innovative ways. Um, hopefully this will replicate itself in other avenues, in other countries, in other spheres outside of education. And we feel that we're making an impact and we'll continue to make an impact. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. I know uh, from the film, I had some things that really stand out in my mind, and I know I'm sure it is for each one of you here. The second part of our symposium will be a panel discussion to discuss Lee's uh, uh, talk and the video and other things. So I'd like to ask the panel, the panelists, to please come to the stage now, and the moderator to please come. While they're coming up, I will say briefly, uh, we have a live face-to-face -face audience. We also have a virtual audience. And um, it, the, both the virtual audience and the live audience can submit questions, and we do this electronically. And so um, to submit a question at any time, simply text or email us the following, uh, the fo following instructions at the bottom of the screen. For those of you on the, at the live event, instructions are also printed on the cards you find at your seat. Your questions will be transmitted electronically, and then we will get those uh, to the panelists, to the moderator. I know in our virtual uh, audience, there, I, I think, is at least one person from Israel. I think it's about somewhere tomorrow there in Israel. And uh, so, uh, Stephanie Case and I are working on a research project with a, a, a researcher in Israel. So, Iris, if you're watching, Shabbat Shalom. Okay. <laughs> so, I'd like to begin by introducing our panel participants. Dr. Kathy Dodd is Associate Superintendent of Teaching and Learning at Union Public Schools. Dr. Dodd currently serves as the Associate Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, overseeing unions 19 schools and the instructional programming for students in early childhood through adult education. Prior to coming to Union, Kathy was an elementary and middle level teacher, a district science curriculum specialist, and the director for science for the Oklahoma State Department of Education. So Kathy Dodd. Our next panelist is Rabbi Mark Fitzerman. Rabbi Fitzerman was raised in Oak Park, Michigan. He was educated at the University of Michigan and earned a master's degree and ordination at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. He came to Congregation B'nai Imuna in 1985. He's strongly committed to Teach for America here in Tulsa, and he also founded a pro-social pro small business which brings together uh, individuals from his synagogue, and the homeless, mentally ill citizens of Tulsa to help them in their plight. So Rabbi Fitcherman, welcome. Our next panelist is Ms. De Deborah Givens, a retired Tulsa school teacher and never retired mom. Debbie was a Carver Middle School language arts teacher and over 20 years ago, Debbie and a teacher from Israel partnered to provide students at Carver and in Israel the opportunities to learn about each other through exchange programs, music, dance, and a concurrent unit of study on the Holocaust. This Carver-Israel partnership is still going on today. You can actually read about that. Just uh, Google Carver-Israel partnership and you read what's going on today. While at Carver, Debbie was not only a full-time teacher but also a full-time mom whose son and daughter attended Carver and Booker T. Washington High School. Debbie and her daughter are both proud alums of the University of Tulsa. We also have Reverend Marlon Lavenhire, Senior Minister, All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa. Dr. Marlon Lavenhire is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and has been the Senior Minister of All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa since 2000. He is from an interfaith home raised by a Jewish father and a Catholic mother, and during his tenure, all Souls has been awarded Partner of the Year in Tulsa Public Schools Partners in Education and has adopted three Tulsa Public Schools. In 2008, All Souls, this is, miracles do happen here, a mostly white, theologically liberal church 
merged with New Dimensions Church, a predominantly African-American Pentecostal congregation. Over the past decade, the church has made reconciliation and inclusion central aspects of its mission. And also All Souls Unitarian Church is the largest church in the uh, Unitarian Association. And comes to our moderator is Dr. Denise Dutton. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, Denise. Denise is Assistant Provost for Honors Program and the Henneke Center for Academic Fulfillment. Through the Henneke Center, Denise organizes forums to address common challenges in teaching and to highlight strategies TU professors are using to engage students in the life of the mind and advance their learning. She also develops and maintains resources to support faculty in their teaching, advising, and professional leadership. So Denise, could you please come to the podium and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it is uh, truly an honor and privilege to be participating in today's discussion about Lee's inspiring um, work. We had the privilege to uh, have a student conversation at TU this morning um, that was supposed to run from 10 until 10.50 and he was such an engaging conversationalist um, that uh, one, students were up and intellectually engaged at 10 a.m., which is not the usual student time frame, but uh, it, 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 they, they didn't leave till 11.15, 11.20 when we had to keep Lee on his schedule, and I'm, I'm really pleased to say that, that some of the students that were there this morning have uh, come back for more to, to continue to think about the power um, of this model of bilingual integrated education, um, both its possible applications here locally and implications. Um, so the, the purpose of the symposium is to think about those questions, application of this idea, how we might not just celebrate and recognize these work, but spread its power by thinking about um, what it can do in our own lives, our own communities, and, and other opportunities for it. So before I turn to the panelists, um, I just want to observe, I think this symposium this year is is unique because Lee's idea that we're discussing, as we're discussing it, we have the opportunity to actually enact it. So I wanna invite each of us in the audience here today and online to think for just a moment about a moment in your life where you have sidestepped a difficult moment where you had the opportunity to, is I think of Lee's work as bringing people together across their differences. In our own individual lives, can you think of a moment where you sidestepped that opportunity and decided not to connect with someone who was different, perhaps out of fear that you might misstep or fear of the unknown? And I, I just ask you to hold that moment in mind and think for a minute about where you were when it happened and why it happened. And with that obstacle in your mind, listen to the panelists, and I'm, I'm sure Lee will uh, take some questions today too. As we think about the implication of his ideas, we might hold that personal experience of ours in our mind so we can see how these ideas might help us chip away at those barriers or encounter that obstacle in a more successful way uh, the next time we encounter it. Right. I'd like to start with um, Ms. Deborah Givens. She brings the, the, the perspective of a teacher as well as a parent to help us begin to think about uh, what this hand-in-hand -hand model of Lee's work um, uh, it, uh, implies for uh, our own classrooms here in Tulsa. Um, what does this sort of um, bilingual integrated education look like in the classroom and, and what, are, what do teachers doing and what do they need in order to make it happen? Uh, as I was reading and watching some of the videos that we, uh, maybe I need to pull it closer, that uh, Lee had online and different news reports, etc. And it took me back to uh, 1975 when I first became a part of Carver Middle School. And at that time, we had a small school. They, tried to keep the faculty exactly 
50-50 and the student body, African-American and white, then there were others in there. Um, and experiences like our staff had to be committed to what we were doing. You could not be hired if you were not committed to the goal of integration. And this, um, the, one of the teachers, African-American males who wanted to, uh, I was having a party at my home, you know, because we had to constantly do things with the staff. Uh, behind the scenes. We were coming right out of segregation. And uh, we didn't have a war going on like some of the kids in the, are being, uh, like in the video that you were showing. But he said to me, um, Debbie, I don't know if I can come to your neighborhood. And in a joking way, but he was also serious. And I understood, that opened my eyes. And another time I was shopping with a friend, African-American teacher, and the guy followed us around in the store the whole time, and I'd never experienced anything like that. So my own experiences helped me to be a better teacher, I think, um, in this integrated school. Now, we started out with small groups, and we did lots of role-playing interactions. And we could not have done any of this without lots of parent support. And it's not easy. Um, coming from two different backgrounds, the teachers, the parents, and the students, all of us. So um, I can, it just really goes to my heart to know what you're doing. And so often, we feel like, you know, we're just a small group, a drop in the bucket. But we have to start somewhere at changing the world. And I do believe that our young people, that's where we start. The, um, so we, I will tell you this in my experience, that if you were to walk into our cafeteria, it would look segregated. And we had to require students in classroom projects or when we went on field trips. Um, I took a group to Toronto, 100 kids once. We had to, any class project, make sure that they, they were mixed racially so that they did get that experience. Otherwise, it's much more comfortable to stay around the people that you know. And um, I mean, that's true even in families. <laughs> when you go to a family reunion, it's easier to go that way. But the amazing thing was, was seeing the relationships build among the students and the parents and working together as a team with our goal in mind. Now, things have changed a lot, more demands, on the school, more students wanting to be there, huge waiting list. It's difficult to get African American teachers. They, um, and hopefully that will change. But I know, as a, as a parent, I was very proud of my students um, as I saw them have sleepovers at my house and at their friend's house, and as I see them still connected today. And students, through Facebook, I see their accomplishments and that they are still connected. So I do believe it's been a, a big success, even though things are not exactly the way we started out and intended it to be, and, and, and that was our dream. Um, I think that's good for now. Oh, great. Thanks, mm -hmm. Debbie. Yeah, and I, I think you call our attention to the way in which um, Lee's Hand in Hand Network is thinking about both those individual relationships, the personal friendships that, um, that education, particularly when we start early, can give deep roots to, um, but then how we surround that and support that with um, community, uh, the teachers, the staff, 
the parents, the larger community. So, so with that, I might um, turn to, to, to Kathy, to you to think about um, uh, models of education that, that help uh, link support for the teacher in the classroom and the students learning along with parents and families in the larger community. Yes, so this is my 19th year at Union Public Schools. Um, I came to this work in uh, thinking more intentionally about diversity and inclusion, really by grace and by chance, by so many of the other great things that have happened to me in my life. I, just to go back just a bit, I, I'm not a graduate of Harvard, but I'm a graduate of Yale but not the Ivy League version, but the little bitty town in Payne County, right on Highway 51, that is between uh, here and, and Stillwater. And I grew up in a community that was very homogeneous. Everyone looked a whole lot like me. They were white and mostly poor. And um, I'm an adopted child. I have no idea about my, my biological background. But when I decided to be a teacher and took my first job in a very diverse, high poverty school district in a very diverse and high poverty school, I realized how I was not prepared for the cultural competencies I needed to be effective in my role. And so now, fast forward, I'm a mom of a, a senior in high school at my school, and I very intentionally put her in a place where she would not have that same experience, where she could not by attending even um, you know, a workshop or reading a book, but through her everyday life, have those intentional experiences where we weren't telling her that she needed to do, to, to appreciate others, but she was learning that very organically, much in the way Lee's schools have evolved, by falling in love with people who didn't look like her, whose backgrounds weren't like hers. And that's been such a joy for me to experience as a part of my school district, both from the perspective of an administrator who intentionally tries to, to create systemically and systematically those programs that foster that type of uh, learning for students, but then also being the beneficiary of that and watching how that's developed through friendships and hearing the conversations that happen in my own back seat of my car as I drive children around from my entire, my entire school district. Um, and so that's just been such a joy. But my, my school has changed dramatically over the 19 years that I've been in the district. When I came, we were 15% free and reduced lunch. Today, we are 70%. When I came, we were mostly Caucasian. Today, there are more Hispanic students. 34% of my district is Hispanic. 30% of my school district is Caucasian. Um, so it's a very diverse in many ways, religiously, culturally, economically, linguistically, over 70 languages spoken at my school. And, and for the parents who choose to be a part of that district, and, and I mean intentionally move into the district, especially our more affluent parents, they're choosing that much in the way that parents did for Lee's school. And I had the joy, um, by being a part of a Religions United trip, I had the joy of going with 21 other Tuls uh, Tulsans and Oklahomans, I should say, to go to Israel. And one of the places we visited in our dual narrative trip that had both a Palestinian guide and Israeli guide that included a group of, of individuals that one imam, three rabbis, five pastors and uh, a diverse group of policymakers and my husband, a police officer, myself as an educator, we were able to have a dialogue about your school, about many places that we visited where we were looking for that synergy where we were finding commonality. We were finding not just, not tolerance, but a, a true joy in looking at what I would say, the, the best in each other and realizing how that could benefit us. Not, not tolerance, I don't like that. I don't like that as an idea of teaching tolerance. It's more of a celebration of the unique nature of what each group is bringing to the table. And we see that within our school district. We saw that modeled on this trip. And within my own school district, we use that in a, in a concept called community schools, where we intentionally remove barriers to student success by making partnerships with people in the community, faith-based and otherwise, to try to help bridge that gap so that students can have access to as much of what the community can offer and try to level that playing field for students across the board. 
Fantastic, thank you. <clears throat> this is a nice segue then um, into uh, Rabbi Fitzerman. Um, I know uh, there's a lot of work at B'nai that's uh, around building community and um, I, I, I just want to share, I have uh, twin five-year-olds who are at the preschool at Benet, and um, the power of inclusion, I think, Kathy, your distinction between tolerance and inclusion, um, the school starts every Monday with a, a ceremony, book reading, we sing songs in English, Hebrew, and Spanish, and my girls happen to have a speech delay, and so sign is how we communicate, and it is a powerful thing for them. It, it empowers them to be full members of the community that they sign, and uh, I'm struck by how it empowers my husband and I to be full members of that community. So, so uh, Rabbi, if you could um, help us think about how this model builds a Thank shared society. And I want to salute our Preschool Director Shelley Wright, who's with us this, more, this afternoon. Shelley is largely responsible for those gains in the way we do preschooling at the synagogue. And I offer my own applause. Like, I would guess many of you here, I spent lots of time over the last several, several days trying to get to know hand in hand. It was a project that I knew absolutely nothing about until Yochai mentioned that he had nominated the project and that it had earned the Brock Award. And I probably spent more time than I expected looking at the material that panelists were sent, and I realized that I was looking for hope, that I wanted to experience a program, even if it could only be secondhand, that offered a uh, a measure of optimism on the ability of small groups to make large changes and affect a whole society. My political world feels as if it's very complicated right now. My cultural and social worlds feel as if they're complicated, and I wanted an antidote to all of that, and I found it in the material that I saw come through from hand in hand. I was very struck not only with the words, but the images that came in our shared packet. And I'm thinking now of one particular photograph. It's a group of seven or eight youngsters, maybe nine years old, and Lee probably knows this photograph well. Nine years old, they're in a semicircle. I would say six boys, maybe one girl. I couldn't tell the difference between what looked to me like Sephardic youngsters in, I think it was the Jerusalem school, and kids who might have come from the Arab community, the Arab community of the school. But there were two objects in the foreground. One looked to me like some Israeli version of a Barbie house. It was a small blue enclosure with pink curtains and Barbie furniture, and it was the kind of thing that I expected to see in an elementary school or a preschool. And the other was a model of the Dome of the Rock. These two structures were side by side in the picture, and they were both kind of casually displayed, but they anchored the image. And there's a boy in the picture as part of this semicircle who's kind of playing with a tin foil crescent that marks the top of the Dome of the Rock. It's beautifully done, but it was clearly a classroom project. Build something important to you. Build some small model of something that you care about. And the casualness of this gathering, and the fact that these boys were in easy, and the girl were in easy relationship with these two models, was very deeply affecting for me. I thought, here's a group of kids who were assigned a project. I don't know how the Dome of the Rock came to be or the Barbie House came to be, but it seemed exactly right when it comes to some things I feel we all know about community formation. If you hand a group, say, oh, Habitat for Humanity, 
some lumber and some nails and, and, and power tools, they are not only going to build a house, but they are going to come to know each other. If they are strangers at the beginning of the project, they are going to come to know each other vastly better in the course of building this house. They'll learn something about each other in three dimensions. They will no longer see each other as masks or stereotypes or types of any kind. They will come to a level of intimacy which they can't really achieve in any other way. Physical proximity, day after day in project work, really matters, really counts, and really produces community. I have to say that this is a challenge for me. David Brooks just wrote an article in the New York Times, and he said, get up from your desk and go out into the streets, because real change isn't a product of Facebook. It's a product of people holding hands, standing shoulder to shoulder. He used a couple of cliches of his own, but, but I believe those things, and it's a challenge for me. I'm a little fussy, I'm a little self-conscious, I don't play exceptionally well with others, <laughs> Shelley would say that. I, I, I just don't, and I have to challenge myself in many different ways to get up from my desk and go out into the streets and stand with other people. Or sometimes in the kitchens of the synagogue, um, I think it mentioned our project in uh, pro-social -so, pro baking at the synagogue. It's made an enormous difference in the way I view my own life and in the way I view the lives of intermittently homeless, mentally ill citizens of Tulsa, that we are at the synagogue baking side by side with one another. They say things that are astonishing in their honesty, in their vulnerability. I, I look at myself in an entirely different way and uh, in, 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 in a way I wouldn't have expected, I feel comfortable with people who are very, who live lives that are very different from my own. As it happens, All Souls and B'nai Amuna are now involved in a project where we're trying to build a community of immigrant advocates and oppose the wholesale deportation of persons without documents. Uh, it, it means that I've been forced to attend committee meetings, which is really hard for me, and hear people who oppose my point of view and don't bring the same impulses that I do to organizational work, and to stand outside the David L. Moss Criminal Justice Center and hold up signs and say words together with people I don't really know. We are asking people now to act in the part of, uh, to act in a project of accompaniment, where we get into cars with persons without documents, travel to Dallas, that's 4.25 hours, get to know one another, stand with those people in front of an immigration judge and come back. We think that that, that proximity, that traveling together, literally and metaphorically, um, really makes a difference. I would say with Lee that when you put people, again, day after day, that's really important, not occasional convenings, but day after day in the same environment, it really makes a difference in the way people come to see one another. I, I wanted to say one more thing, if I could, about the literature that Hand in Hand has developed, and that's excuse me, that it's radically honest about the program itself. It says we're doing great things, but we're probably not going to achieve peace in this generation. You heard that on the video, and it's quite clearly stated in the literature that Hand in Hand uses to advertise itself and to raise funds. It acknowledges the fact that Muslim children and Christian Arabs sometimes speak Hebrew at home, but very few Israeli Jewish students come to the point where they are speaking Arabic at home. And there are lots of Israeli parents who speak Arabic. There's a kind of disparate level of achievement when it comes to appreciating and enacting diversity between these two bodies of students. But um, I would say that when it comes to modeling, what it means to build a kind of spiritual endeavor with 
powerful political implications hand in hand has really done a job that I personally find inspirational and I hope will be a model for many of the things that um, I, I'm, I'm able to tackle in the years ahead and we're able to tackle in the years ahead. It, it begins with two children speaking to one another parenthetically. Those Arab kids, and Liu may have seen something that I did not see, were also speaking Hebrew in this video, but I think that's probably a function of the fact that they knew that they were being recorded for broadcast on Israeli television and they wanted to be intelligible. Um, in any case, I, I think that um, when it comes to modeling what it means to bring two students together and four students together, then eight students together, and have that make a real difference in the political life of a community, a city, and then a nation. Hand in Hand shows us a lot, including its own willingness to state the truths about its successes and failures, to state, in other words, um, to, to disclose um, in a vulnerable way what goes right in projects like this and what sometimes doesn't go as well as, um, as, its, um, uh, as its founders and as its, um, as its inheritors may have planned. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. And um, uh, Reverend Lavenhar, I, th I thought you might be able to share with us as well, both supporting schools as our public institutions of shared space as well as creating interfaith um, communities. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, speaking of the interfaith component of this seems like a part, something that I could, I could add. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Mr. Gordon, so inspired by your work, the video, seeing uh, folks coming together in this way is so inspiring, and Mr. Brock for hosting this and making this all possible. Uh, this is, this is uh, it's wonderful to be a part of this. I'm really honored to. I, I'm going back to thinking in my mind about a story that I heard, and I believe it was through the University of Tulsa, that before the civil rights movement really came to Tulsa back in the early 60s, there was at the I believe it was at the University of Tulsa, there was a psychological uh, professor who was doing a study on clergy. And so he brought together the clergy of Tulsa from a lot of different denominations, including Rabbi Rosenthal from, from Temple Israel, my predecessor, Dr. Wolf, but the other ministers from First Presbyterian and from Grace Lutheran and from around the city together, and they met but their conversation wasn't about theology. They weren't debating theology. They were talking about what it meant to be a minister and what they went through with their families and with the members of their congregations and all of these things. So over a period of months, and a year, I believe, they did this study, they became incredibly close so that when the civil rights movement hit, these colleagues were bonded. They knew each other as men. They were all men back then, but they knew each other as people and it was because they had spent that time together and gotten to know each other that these leaders led this community through the civil rights period in a really profound way. Things happened in Tulsa during that era that did not happen in other parts of the country. For example, white folks coming in and, and, and integrating schools in the African-American neighborhoods. That's something that was not happening around the country but happened here in part because of that kind of leadership that was formed by being in proximity with one another. So I, I wanna hold that up as, as an example of how important it is to, to be uh, close with other people and, and to get to know them. And so when I saw the pictures of these young students on, on the video getting to know each other, it just reminded me, of, uh, it reminded me of the, when we talk about the dreamers here in the United States, we talk about how, you know, they didn't come here on their own accord. They just landed here because their parents brought them. They're doing the best they can as kids. And I see these, these young people in your program and in your schools. They're just kids. They, just, they didn't do anything to creating conflict. They just want to have a good life like everybody else. And they're doing the best they can. And you're giving them, giving them an opportunity through education. And I, and, I, and I realized that we've created public education to pull people out of their, their parochial lives. That, that people, you know, you grew up in some small town or some small village, everybody goes to the same church, everybody goes, you know, you, you have your own home. Maybe in your home there's violence, maybe in your home there's prejudice, you, all kinds of things in the home pulls them out, puts them in a public education where they have to be with all kinds of other families and teachers from other religions and other backgrounds, and, and we learn from each other. And so it's one of the 
great strengths of public education that we that were allowed to, to that were not allowed but that were brought into relationship with other people uh, in this way and so and it teaches us to you know at its best to learn to listen to one another and understand ourselves and each other in the process I you know your story about it's only 1800 which is an incredible number by the way but in a in a country of 1.8 million people and I think a Dorothy I believe it was Dorothy Day who said you know we we should never forget that that uh, you know people will say you know what can a small group of people do and she uh, to change the world and and she says it's the only thing that ever has it always starts with that small nucleus that that changes everything uh, I'll conclude by, by using this reference. In my congregation, we read the Bible uh, and the scriptures metaphorically as opposed to literally. And so for us, when we talk about Jerusalem, obviously Jerusalem exists literally as a place in Israel. But when we talk about Jerusalem, we're talking about it metaphorically. It's the place where humanity and God come together. It's any place where humanity and God come together. And our job, I believe, all of us, no matter what faith we're, we're a part of, is to, to create Jerusalem wherever we are. When, we, when, when Jews say next year in Jerusalem, for me, it means that, that we're going to work this whole year to create Jerusalem right here wherever we are. We're going to create an environment where human beings and, and divinity, the holiness, can happen everywhere. And I believe that's what you're doing, Mr. Gordon, and I believe that in a way that's what the Brock Prize represents. You are honoring people who are creating Jerusalem wherever they are. And so it's an honor to be a part of this forum. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Uh, it is inspiring work. I want to uh, push us to think about some of the challenges. Um, and so I might just um, follow on Marlon's um, words to say, what are those things we see um, in, in, in the Hand in Hand Network? There is a, a history and a conflict and a language difference. And I wonder if. Um, the hand in hand network helps us see more clearly here in our own um, uh, in our own community the ways in which we might be missing one another, so that when we come together, we we fail to live up to that challenge. So I, I don't know if any of the panelists wanted to take a stab at identifying what are the ways um, we're missing one another now in the 21st century that um, that might be masked over because we share a common language um, or. Um, because the public schools come together um, in, in a less purposeful way, perhaps. I mean, I'll, I'll start with, with to say that I think that what, what happens with us sometimes here in the United States, because, and in Tulsa, because we sort of see ourselves as all being the same, hey, we're all Americans, and there's a kind of a, a sense of colorblindness, if you will, like, hey, we're all just people, people are people, which is such an important thing in a place like Israel where people are at war, to, to say, hey, we're all just people and find what we have in common so that we can live together and stop killing each other. But, but in our context where we're not killing each other, there's, it's easy to, that minimization of our differences can actually lead to a, a, a uh, a sensibility that, well, I, everybody's just like me. If, every, if we're all the same, then everybody's just like me. So if anyone acts any different than I act, you know, how they shake hands, how they show up, how they, you know, think or what they think about something, then they're just wrong. Because, you know, there's a universal sense and I'm, you know, whatever I think is obviously the same way that everyone else thinks. So if someone doesn't think that way, then they're just wrong. And as opposed to being able to recognize that there are different people with different situations, values, and backgrounds that, that are coming at something differently and to really honor that difference. I can see in, in your school, uh, in your schools with Hand in Hand, that, that they're forced to hear each other's stories. What's your home life like? What's mine like? It's different. We have different language, different religion. They're forced to deal with that diversity in a way that we can mask. And when we mask that difference, I think we, we really uh, end up projecting our own values, our own ideas onto other people, and that creates more division rather than less. You know, I, would, I wish we would have had students on the panel because I think that they are so much better equipped to navigate this conversation than we are as adults. At least I've witnessed that within my own school district. Um, we, we have a leadership retreat for 250 of our 3,400 high school students. We have 3,400 students under one roof every day. And 
really day in and day out, it all goes really well um, with that many students. But we have a leadership retreat, retreat with 250 of those kids, and we ask them in a, a fill in the blank, not a multiple choice, but I mean, a free response. We say, what do you love most about your high school? What areas do we also ask what areas could we improve? But year after year with different groups of students, we hear from them that they appreciate the diversity among the student body, that their, that their peers are very interesting people, and they love that about their school. And so I, I think kids, whether we're talking about just race or religion, but we're also talking about gender identity and relationship identity and so many other things, difference, you know, topics of difference, where kids are navigating that with a whole lot more finesse than we are as adults. And I feel, I feel very optimistic about the future for that because kids are having that conversation more. I think they're calling us to the, the carpet to, to do more conversation about, have more conversation about race. I think that's something that for us as a, as a school entity, as a profession, we could talk about students who cha are challenged by poverty. We can talk about language. We can talk about religion. I think the race, quest the race conversation is one that's harder for us to navigate, and we need more assistance with that, and we need to, to go ahead and get it out there because our, how we respond to that conversation and how intentional we are, because you were very intentional in what you set out to create. And we have a different model in a large public school where our kids have 16,000 kids, and they come to us. We're not <laughs> selecting any student. They're, in fact, where they live determines where they go to school. So that requires a whole different set of strategies on the part of the school district because you're not getting that parent who's choose necessarily seeking that out. In some cases, yes. But in many cases, you're, you're, the student's going to where they live. And so how do you create that sense of community? And how, do you, how are we transparent with students so they recognize that that is a part of the fabric or the core ideology of the organization? And every time we tell our students that, when we point out ways that we're philanthropic in our work, that, um, that we try to strategically remove barriers for students by having, we have mental health professionals that come into our school, 40 of them that are paid for out of the community, and they come into our schools and help kids in that tier two work in, in mental health. We, we have two clinics where 4,000 people in East Tulsa come as their primary care provider to my school every day to, to be seen by doctors and physicians assistants and nurses, and that's thanks to the University of Oklahoma. But we've made those intentional partnerships because we're trying to remove those barriers. When the kids really understand that, they're exceedingly proud that they're a part of an organization that wants to help others. They're, they're personally benefiting from it, but they also see how that's leveling the playing field for the kids around them. I'd like to make a point that I think Marlon would have made if he went on just a little bit longer, and that's that we do actually kill each other. And we kill each other for reasons having to do with the different languages we speak and the, the foundations on which each of us stand, uh, which are sometimes very different from the people around us. Khalid Jabara was killed by a man in Tulsa who did not, who could not understand the life experience of his next door neighbor and did not have the equipment it might have taken in order to see him in three dimensions, in a fully rounded way. He saw someone who was a different color, who spoke with a different accent, whose family gathered at the dinner table for a meal that differed from his own and reacted violently to that sense of differentness. Uh, I speak, and it's very hard for me, I want to acknowledge my own limitations, it's very hard for me to disengage from those limitations myself. I, I speak as a function of my own particular education, the ethnic background of my family. I, I speak a language that feels right for the community in which I operate, but it's sometimes hard for me to make myself 
understood in other settings and to understand other people. I, I was born outside of Detroit and I feel like a Midwesterner and in the course of interviewing for different positions along the way, I felt that I was equipped only to deal with Midwestern Jews. That's how <laughs> limited I think I am. I couldn't communicate with coastal Jews. They didn't understand me. I didn't understand them. And I want to acknowledge those limitations. I speak from a, from a place of privilege, from a place of whiteness, and I think that this issue of language, as it's understood in the hand-in-hand -hand community, has to really make a difference in the way we approach our own work. To my great regret, it's shameful that I have been in Oklahoma for over 30 years, and I cannot assemble a single sentence even a short sentence in Spanish. I, I see that as an extraordinary failure on my part and on the part of people like me who haven't gone to the trouble, let alone my understanding of Native American communities. Very few of us are equipped to make ourselves understood outside our own communities of birth and education. Um, I think that if we could do some of the things that Hand in Hand expects of its students, simply communicate in a different language, we'd take the next big step. I'm also interested in that question of fear as an insurmountable barrier. Mm -hmm. It took us a long time to place ourselves, at least at the synagogue, in the company of homeless, mentally ill citizens of Tulsa. They say things that would make most people's jaws drop open. It's very difficult to reckon sometimes with their own level of self-disclosure, their, their own radical honesty. And, and we had to put aside some fear in order to deal productively with the situation that we ourselves wanted to create. Uh, I, I, I think that that may be a, a place where I wonder, Lee, if you and the school would look carefully at what kids are saying when they claim that at a border checkpoint they see uh, an, a, a fellow student one way, and as soon as they pass that checkpoint, they see them in another way altogether. I wonder if that's actually true and whether they carry over more from the experience of the humiliating experience of being stopped at a checkpoint than they actually realize. Acknowledging the depth of our fear is a, a really important component, it seems to me, in this conversation. Our fear, our loathing, our mistrust, and really digging deep to see how, 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 how deep those tentacles reach in our own souls. Mm. I think fear is huge in keeping us from advancing um, in our relationships. Not, but I do believe it's with the students, with the leadership of the teachers and their parents setting examples that that's how it's truly going to change the world is. For example, a teacher, um, oh, through teaching literature, which is what I taught, it opens the doors for discussions and you hear a student talk about walking through the parking lot and um, a white person pulling their children or grabbing their purse under their arm. And it's, it's experiences like that, exchanges like that, that change the kids and to see each other equally. And they are our leaders, and I trust them because of their experiences. Even though it's a small group, each life that they touch will make a change. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, uh, uh, this conversation reminds me of sort of recognizing our limitations. Um, one of the uh, additional advantages of those co-taught co classrooms of um, how do we think about teaching as a team activity and, and how do, what does that do to our curriculum, what does that do to our classrooms to create space where teachers are modeling by their relationship with one another and, and, and navigating, um, leading that classroom together um, and helping then our students make that navigation as well. 
Gosh, I'm just sitting here thinking about the joy of having two teachers in a classroom so that we would have to think about how to navigate that problem. I can't, you know, in the state of Oklahoma, we're having a hard time finding a teacher for each classroom. So and that's a problem I would love to explore, to have the resources, because it's, it's truly, you know, it wasn't lost on me as I visited hand in hand that that is a well-resourced school. I mean, there are, it, it is a noble cause and there's much we can learn from it. But when we look in Oklahoma and we think about packing 35 kids in a classroom with one teacher who might be emergency certified, this becomes very difficult to try to just try to have school under those conditions, let alone be strategic about all of these other life lessons that should be the focus. And, and so I, I think we're missing the mark um, you know, if you walk into my office, you'll see I have on. The, I was telling Marvin this story, but I have a huge chalkboard in my office, and it has the Frederick Douglass quote of, "You know, it's easy to, easier to build strong children than to repair broken men." For us, we're just missing so many of those opportunities in Oklahoma to try to foster conversations like this because we're so at the low level on Maslow's hierarchy of just trying to meet students' basic needs. And, and the level of sophistication for what's being done in your schools or something we're all aspiring to. There's not one school leader in this city that wouldn't jump on the chance to, have, to replicate what you have. It's just such a gap between where we are financially and where we would need to be to start having that conversation in a meaningful way. Great, thank you. Um, I, I wonder for our future teacher in the audience, um, we put a lot, uh, our teachers do a lot of work. Uh, what's the one thing, um, thinking about this model, that uh, one of our students preparing to be a future teacher ought to be sure to put that tool in her toolkit um, so that she can um, bring this sort of work into her classroom? As if there's only one thing, right? <laughs> I think our teachers that, that succeed really um, in this work, and that's probably one, that's a, a question probably for Lee to answer, but are the teachers who love the kids and love the kids who are there, not the kids that they want to be there, mm -hmm. but meeting the kids where they are and recognizing that as public school teachers, we don't pick the kids we serve. This, we serve the student that walks in the door and really celebrating that opportunity to serve that child and loving the student. The kids have incredible radar and they know when they're loved and supported and that's when they can be vulnerable enough, I think, to engage in. We're modeling for them what we're hoping to see in the relationships that they're fostering. So you really, you have to love the kids you're serving and, and not just love the work. That's not enough. Lee, do you, <clears throat> would you like to uh, say? A I mean, it, one of the things, it's, it's very important what you said, Kathy, that, um, you know, our schools, because we're small, we have 1,800 students, we're six schools, um, we can successfully fundraise around the world because there is a lot of support in the American Jewish community for Israel, and we've sort of redirected some of that support and make them think about supporting all of Israel, not just the Jewish population, also the Arab population. Um, one of the complaints we've heard from some people is, well, you know, can you, if we were to replicate your model and open up 100 schools, how would you fund all of these extra teachers? First of all, one way is that, you know, teachers, teachers across the world make very little money, not enough money, maybe in Germany. I know teachers, I think that the status of teachers is very high there, but in Israel, they make very little money. I mean, the average salary in a country where the cost of living is higher than the United States, the average salary is about $35,000 a year. So that's one way where it's a little bit more affordable. Our teachers are, are part of, most of them part of the public school system. But it is possible that um, if we hit a certain tipping point, then we wouldn't be able to replicate the model exactly, and we'd have to compromise with the numbers of teachers. But at the same time, if we hit a point where we had 100 schools, our impact on the wider issue of Jewish-Arab relations would be much greater. You know, you know, ideally, we would be at a point where relations between the two populations in Israel would be so good that we wouldn't, we could take for granted that kids are going to school together, they're getting along, they're meeting each other, things like that. So 
you know, here I'm, I may be trying to portray hand in hand as a model, not necessarily to be replicated, but to make people just imagine that people can get along in Israel, that in our society things can be different. And I'll give you an example of one of the impacts that we've had that doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, there are now, I think, about 60 schools in Israel that are using pieces of our curriculum in various ways. Um, one, maybe the strongest example of that, are Jewish schools and Arab schools that have agreed to have classes that are twinned. So your school has a twin relationship with the city of Tib with a school in Tiberias. So once a week or even once a month, uh, an Arab class from an Arab school and a Jewish class from a Jewish school meet. It's not as nice as coming together every day, but it's something if it can be done well. Um, we have a, a, a in, in, is in Israel, religion is not, you can, you can talk about religion in public schools. Um, our schools are secular, there's no prayer, but we celebrate holidays, and our schools have Christian Arabs, Muslim Arabs, and Jews, and we created a teaching guide, which sounds really nice in Hebrew, it's called Barakat, which is the Hebrew acronym for Old Test New Testament, Quran, and Old Testament. Jewish kids learning about Islam and Christianity, Christian kids learning about Islam and Judaism, etc. That's being used in a lot of different schools. Um, you'd, you'd think that in a place where that's the birthplace of, of two religions and a, a very holy place for Islam, that people would know a lot of each other's religions, and the, the opposite is true. I mean, ignorance is more prevalent than, than knowledge, and so it's a way for people to learn a little bit without being a school for theology. It's a way for them to learn. Um, and finally, uh, you saw Nadia Kinani, this very forceful, strong, she's a, a secular Muslim Arab from the city of Nazareth and has been living in Jerusalem for many years. She is part of a principal's forum in Jerusalem, and the local school district placed her among Jewish principals because in, in West Jerusalem, most of the schools are Jewish. And in the very first meeting they had, there were maybe 25 principals. She's the only Arab, and they're all going around in the room introducing themselves, and they're all talking as if the whole world is Jewish, everybody's Jewish, and it comes to her, maybe she's the 10th or 11th person to speak, and she says, you know, I happen to be an Arab and Muslim, not everybody here is Jewish, not everybody in this country is Jewish. And you had religious, Orthodox Jewish principles, non-religious, people who were right-wing, people who were left-wing, they meet once a month, and they've been doing this now for years, and she has this very strong impact on these people who, they're, they're administrators of schools, of large schools, and they, it's opened their eyes. So those are other ways that hand-in-hand -hand can have an impact without necessarily needing to fund more and more models. I mean, we do hope to have maybe 15 schools around the country. That will maybe be the limit of what we can have. Um, and we'll have maybe 10,000 school children and, and another 10 or 15,000 adults engaged in things. But that can be, you know, a movement. It can be an actual movement in a country that's small like Israel and can have a reverberating effects, kind of. Um, and I too, I was re I read yesterday, I was in Norman, and I read in the Norman local newspaper about what's happening and that there's a possibility of a uh, statewide walkout, but that it'll be the administration and students and teachers, and hopefully there'll be more funding. I mean, it's not a problem, you know, just particular to Oklahoma. It's all over the world, really. And um, I mean, I've always said that, you know, teacher salaries should be higher, and maybe some Wall Street bankers should have teacher salaries, but that, that's, you know, hopefully. That's Thanks. Really I'm afraid our time for the symposium has coming to a close. Um, I'd, uh, uh, I'd just like to uh, invite you to thank the panelist and Lee Gordon. And, and I hope as you leave here today, you'll um, connect that, that hand in hand, showing up every day to do the work because each one of us can make a small difference to change a large problem. Um, uh, and, and I just want to flag a, a couple ways you might do that. Um, Rabbi Fitzerman suggested one, learning Spanish. Um, every month um, the, there at the Khalid Jabara Memorial Library, there is a, a, a social justice story hour where they invite children at the very youngest of age to begin these conversations and uh, us parents get to come and learn along with them. So, so there are just two ways, I'm sure there's many more, and as we think about the important role schools serve to build our shared society, I know uh, we'll be having lots of conversations about how we support our teachers and schools in that work. So thank you. Thank you, Denise.
Yes, I also thank uh, the panelists and Lee, thank you so much. And Denise, especially, thank you. You did a very good job. Thank you so much. In your seats, we have a feedback card, and we'd like uh, to re you to fill it out. If you just take a couple of minutes. We uh, try to adjust things every little time we have one of these. We try to tweak it, make it a little better. And if you like it, if you really have good things to say, fill out a lot of cards, and then we'll just. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'd like to recognize several individuals who who have contributed greatly to the planning and development of this symposium. Uh, again, I thank uh, Provost Roger Blaze. It's always a pleasure to work with University of Tulsa people, and you are such a great supporter. We, we appreciate you so much. Uh, again, I thank Dr. Denise Dutton for moderating, Doc, uh, Ms. Susie Thompson for her help, uh, Kate Robertson, James Hollinger, Jesse Rice, Neil Scott, thank you so much for all your help. There's also a couple of people that could not be here because of um, death in the family and um, an injury in the family. One is Aliyah Shami, who is very involved in the Muslim community here in town. And another person that was supposed to be on the uh, panel today, Dr. Imam Ahmad Nchasi. And he could not, he had a death in his family and he had to, to be there. They did, Aliyah did so much in helping put this together, and so I, hopefully she will look at this on video, and thank you, Aliyah, if you're watching. And uh, my team, Jessica Noonan and Tanya Southern, thank you so much. Uh, Crystal Atkinson and Cindy, couldn't do it without you. And thanks to all of you who came to join the celebration of this afternoon. Please remember, as John Brock often says, the most important thing we do in life is educate our children. So please drive carefully on the way back and go Cowboys, Golden Hurricane, Sooners, and now go hand-in-hand -hand soccer team. <laughs> <laughs>